service of worship. You're incredibly welcome, whether you are a member of First Brashane, a member of another church but are tuning in to us, or whether you don't belong to any church whatsoever. It is great to have you tuning in to us today as we come to worship the Lord and we trust as as we gather in our own homes that we will be blessed by the presence of God with us. Right at the start, I want to apologise uh, that there be no words on our screen today for our songs of praise. Uh, we're working with a minimal number of, of people in the building to keep the, the whole regulations on social distancing, so I apologise for that. But as I ramble through one or two announcements, if, if you're signed up to our Facebook page, you can download this from our Facebook page, which gives you the words of the two songs of praise we'll be using together today. Just a couple of announcements as maybe you want to scramble around and find that page and have it handy on your phones or your tablets. Uh, for our young folks who are in P7 and, and upwards, our youth fellowship called Connect meets uh, every Sunday night uh, during this time of lockdown at 8pm on Zoom on that conference facility. Uh, if you want to sign up to contact one of the, the youth leaders, if you belong here, you know who that is, uh, please contact them or send us a message through our Facebook page and we'll get you the details. And then each Monday night, uh, we, there is a prayer time at 8pm again on Zoom. Uh, if you're a member of this congregation and you would like to join us, and it would be great to see more folks from the congregation join us, or if you have anything in particular you would like us to pray for and you can be assured that it will be kept in confidence amongst those on that prayer time, please give me a call at the manse. I'll give you the details of how you sign up to Zoom or I will pass on your prayer points. 
But we're here to worship, and as we come to worship today, it's great to be back in our meeting house streaming live to you. A uh, wee bit of familiarity, but it's still not the same. I glance around and uh, the empty pews uh, are just a, a sign of the times that we are living in. And I think actually as I was glancing back over my, my notes this morning, I think this is the ninth or 10th Sunday when we have not been able to meet together as a congregation here. And it, it saddens my heart uh, um, that, that you're not here, uh, you're not looking back at me and I'm not uh, being able to speak directly to you. And it's sad in my heart, especially today, when we should have been gathering around the Lord's table. We should have been gathering to uh, celebrate the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. Uh, But it is a meal that the scripture teaches us that it is meant to be celebrated when the church comes together and meets together. Uh, And I look forward to the day when we will be able to, again, gather in this place and celebrate this meal as the family of God. But while we're not gathering, I'm still going to preach a sermon I had planned for today to help us to, to keep our minds focused on the cross uh, and the reason for our hope and our salvation uh, and uh, keep, keep focusing on Christ's sacrifice. And while there are many things I'm saddened about uh, during this time, especially not being able to meet together, there's one thing I am enjoying, and I, I alluded to that a few weeks ago in a sermon, and what I am enjoying is how our services or worship are much simpler than they normally are uh, when we meet. In fact, the reformer, uh, John Calvin's view of worship was that it should be simple, that it should lift the worshiper into a deeper communion with, with Christ as their savior, and that the word of God should be central to what we do. Sadly, today we make too many other things the heart of our worship. Other things become central rather than God's truth. So I thought today when we gather back together, when we, we're, we're in this place and we're streaming, I, I, w- I would go back a little bit to, to our, our roots, to the reformers, to John Calvin. And I'm going to follow roughly, but not exactly, the order of service that he used in his church in Geneva back in, in the 1500s. I've no doubt there'll be all sorts of opinions. People will think that boy lost the plot. He's been locked up too long. Uh, others will, will have other opinions on it. But my hope is that through what we do today, as we, what we do every Sunday, that we will remember what is truly important in our worship, and we will indeed be lifted into deeper communion with Jesus, our Saviour. We're here to worship God. Isaiah one eighteen says, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Lo, your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Lo, they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. Let us pray. Let us confess our sins before God and pray for his pardon upon us. Let us bow before God Almighty. Sovereign Lord, great God and Father, he who is most gracious and filled with mercy and steadfast love, we are or we should be embarrassed to come before you. For we are people who have preferred the ways of this world to the ways of your kingdom. We are people who have rebelled against your wisdom and that has led us into trouble. For we have rejected your good fatherly advice and guidance and have lost our way. God of mercy and grace, we we bow before you and we confess that we have elevated the things of this world above you, the holy God. We have made idols of our possessions, of people. And we have used your name for causes that are not consistent with with you and your purposes. We have permitted our schedules to come first and failed to put worship as a number one priority in our lives. We have lied and we have kept silent, failing to tell the truth. We have laughed at, we have mocked and ridiculed other people. We have failed to love our neighbours as we love ourselves. Forgive us, O God, for for these and the many other ways we, we have fallen short of your glory. 
But we also, at this time, thank you for the hope we have because of your great mercy and grace. We thank you that you have promised to forgive all the guilt of our sin and rebellion against you. And thank you for this wonderful assurance of forgiveness and cleansing by grace through faith in your only perfect son who suffered our punishment and died for our sin upon the cross. And so, most gracious and merciful Father, today we pray that you will open our, our eyes to see the sin in our life. Open our ears to hear your call to repentance and confession. Open our hearts to receive your forgiveness and your salvation. And all of this we plead in the only name by which we can find that salvation, the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. When it came to praise uh, and singing in the church in Calvin's time, he, he simplified what happened compared to what was going on before the Reformation. Calvin removed musical instruments. He removed the choir. And the only songs that were sang were the Psalms from the Genevan Psalter. As we began our service today, Amy was singing a new arrangement of a song based on, on the 130th Psalm. And we're going to sing that again at the end of our service. And I say the words are on our Facebook page if you need it. But we are going to now sing another modern arrangement uh, to a psalm. Uh, one that we probably all know well. We've sung it here in First Christian many times. It's a Stuart Townian ver version of the 23rd Psalm, The Lord's My Shepherd.
turn with me to God's Word, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 29. Uh, we've been looking at Habakkuk up until now, and we're going to finish that next week. But I just thought today, as I said, it was a communion service, or it should have been, uh, and a sermon ready to go. And I thought, well, let's just take this break from Habakkuk and, and, and just take these, this day to, to refocus our mind upon the cross and the salvation that was won for us by Christ's sacrifice. So turn with me, please, to 1 Samuel chapter 29. 1 Samuel 29, and we're going to read the whole chapter together. This is the word of God. Now the Philistines had gathered all their forces at Aphek, and the Israelites were encamped by the spring that is in Jezreel. As the lords of the Philistines were passing on by hundreds and by thousands, and David and his men were passing on in the rear with Achish, the commanders of the Philistines said, What are these Hebrews doing here? And Achish said to the commanders of the Philistines, Is this not David, the servant of Saul, king of Israel, who has been with me now for days and years? And since he deserted to me, I have found no fault in him to this day. But the commanders of the Philistines were angry with him. And the commanders of the Philistines said to him, Send the man back, that he may return to the place to which you have assigned him. He shall not go down with us to battle, lest in the battle he become an adversary to us. For how could this fellow reconcile himself to his Lord? Would it not be with the heads of the men here? Is this not David, of whom they sing to one another in dances? Saul has struck down his thousands, and David his ten thousands. Then Achish called David and said to him, As the Lord lives, you have been honest. And to me it seems right that you should march out and in with me in the campaign. For I have found nothing wrong in you from the day of your coming to me to this day. Nevertheless, the lords do not approve of you. So go back now and go peaceably, that you may not displease the lords of the Philistines. And David said to Achish, But what have I done? What have you found in your servant from the day I entered your service until now, that I may not go and fight against the enemies of my lord the king? And Achish answered David and said, I know that you are as blameless in my sight as an angel of God. Nevertheless, the commanders of the Philistines have said, He shall not go up with us to the battle. Now then, rise early in the morning with the servants of your Lord who came with you, and start early in, in the morning, and depart as soon as you have light. So David set out with his men early in the morning to return to the land of the Philistines. But the Philistines went up to Jezreel. Amen. We thank God for his word to us. And we know he blesses the reading of his truth. There's an old story told of two hunters who uh, came across a bear in the woods. And the bear was so big it scared them. And they, they dropped their rifles and ran for cover. One of the hunters climbed a tree as high as he could, while the other found a cave nearby and ran and hid in it. The bear was in no hurry to eat, and so he sat down between the tree and between the cave, uh, contemplating his good fortune and deciding which would be his main course and which would be his dessert. Suddenly, and for no apparent reason, the man who was in the cave came running out um, and almost ran into the bear who was waiting outside. He stopped for a second and then ran back into the cave as quickly as he had come out. A few seconds later, the same thing happened. He ran out, turned, and ran back in again. And then when he emerged for the third time, his companion up in the tree shouted down to him, Woody, are you crazy? Stay in the cave until this bird disappears. To which Woody replied, gasping for breath, I can't. There's another bear in the cave. Samuel 1 Samuel 29, David was not caught between two bears, but he certainly was caught between a rock and a hard place. As he came face to face with, with his own dilemma, which was completely of his own making. If we were to flip back to 1 Samuel 27, we would see that David found himself in another difficult situation back then. 
He had been under pressure for a long time. King Saul was, was constantly after him. And in verse 1 we read this. Now I shall perish one day by the hand of Saul. David had to make a decision on, on how he was going to deal with this predicament that he was in. And you know, all the experts today would tell you that you should never make any important decisions when you're in a, a, a state of stress, when you're under immense pressure. But David obviously didn't know that advice. For we read on in verse 1, uh, there is nothing better for me than that, that I should escape to the land of the Philistines. Then Saul will despair of seeking me any longer within the borders of Israel, and I shall escape out of his hand. Now you may think, and my immediate reaction may be that David's lost the plot. Does he really realize what he's deciding here, what he's thinking about doing? Because if we go back another few chapters to 1 Samuel chapter 21, we would see that he made a similar decision to go into the land of the Philistines and that nearly cost him his life on that occasion. On this occasion we say, well listen David, maybe he was right in this time, you know, Saul was after him, he, he, there was very few places to hide, maybe it was for the right, the right thing for him to do. Because we read on in chapter 27 that when David did go down to Gath, the land of the Philistines, Saul gave up searching for him. Maybe it was the safer thing to do. But it wasn't the right thing to do. It was the wrong decision for David to make for him. Because that decision to go into the land of the Philistines meant that he was turning his back on the will of God. He was failing to trust in his God. And instead look to the enemies of God for protection rather than Yahweh. And friends, how many times have we done the same thing? We have looked to other places for our solution to the problems we are facing. We have looked to the world and all that it offers rather than turning to God and waiting upon him. David's initial decision may have put him beyond the reaches of Saul for the time being, but it, it opened up another can of worms. It caused all sorts of other problems for him. It ultimately led him to the dilemma that we, we read about in, in 1 Samuel chapter 29, where he now faced a decision to, to stick with the Philistines and go to war against his own people, his own nation, because that is the situation that they were in. Uh, we read in, in 1 Samuel 28 and verse 1, where Achish said to David, you must understand that you and your men will accompany me in the army. What on earth was going to do, David do now? He was stuck between two bears again, between a rock and a hard place. If he refused to fight against his own people, against Israel, he would be guilty of treachery against Achish and executed as a result. But if he did fight against Israel... David would be going against his own word, not to harm the Lord's anointed king, Saul. He would be sinning against his Lord, and therefore he would be subject to the judgment and punishment of his Lord, as David well recognized back in chapter 26 of 1 Samuel. His head must have been absolutely spinning. He must have been lying awake at night wondering what to do. He was in a situation that he couldn't talk himself out of as he had done on previous occasions. How was David going to find deliverance from this dilemma? Well, it certainly didn't come in the way that he expected. David found his deliverance from this terrible situation in the strangest of places. Chapter 28 of 1 Samuel is a bit of an interlude. Uh, and we picked up the, the continuing story of the march against Israel in, in chapter 29. The Philistine troops were, had gathered en masse and were about to la launch a major offensive against the Israelite armies. Time was running out rapidly for David when the Philistine commanders arrived on the scene and asked, What are these Hebrews doing here? David had successfully deceived Achish for, for over a year. 
But these commanders of the Philistine army were a little bit wiser or maybe a little bit more cautious. I'm not quite sure what. But they were well aware of the victory song that had been sung about David by the Israelite people. Saul has struck down his thousands and David his ten thousands. They weren't weren't putting their faith and their trust that David had truly come over to the dark side. They weren't fully believing that he was completely loyal to Achish. And so they tried to get Achish to see the dangers. Wake up, wake up man. Don't you see how dangerous David is? What better way for him to get back in favour with with King Saul than than by coming at us from the inside, by by killing our men from the inside in the battle? Get rid of him. Send him away. He's too dangerous. This is too great a risk. And so David's saviours, those who would deliver him from this terrible dilemma, were in fact his enemies. His deliverance came from the strangest of places. There are two things I want to look at this, this today uh, that we can learn about God when we look at how David was delivered from, from this uh, situation. Firstly, uh, God's ways are, are incredibly surprising. There are some who argue that God would and should only use believers, his own people, to fulfill his purposes and build his kingdom. But here, as we see in 1 Samuel 29, that's obviously not the case. When God used the commanders of the Philistine army to rescue David, it wasn't the first nor was it the last time that he would turn enemies into rescuers. For example, Isaiah 43 prophesies that God would use the pagan Persian king Cyrus to restore the exile of Jerusalem and rebuild the city and the temple. The book of Esther that we studied a year or so ago shows how God used a pagan to the Israelite people from extinction. And the story goes on time and time again. Because God is Lord over all. Even the hearts of those who are his enemies and don't recognize him as God and as Lord. The Lord directs the hearts of all people. Proverbs 21 and verse 1 says, The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. He directs it like a water course wherever he pleases. American pastor and and writer Dale Ralph Davies recalls a a children's story he once heard in which a Christian woman uh, who was alone and out of food was praying to her her heavenly father asking for her daily bread. Somehow an unbelieving neighbour heard this, whether she was a bit of a Daniel and prayed by an open window, I don't know. But an unbelieving neighbour heard the woman's prayers and, and, and being a bit twisted he decided he would have a little bit of fun with her. And so one morning, he, early, in the early hours of the morning, he left two loaves of bread at her door. When the woman found the, the loaves of bread there, she, she burst into praise and, and thanked her God and worshipped him for providing for her need. But the neighbour was around the corner listening and he, he popped around and, and said, well, actually, it wasn't your God, it was me who left the bread there. He didn't answer your prayer, I did. But the woman was still full of joy and full of faith and quickly answered. And he said, oh yes, it was the Lord who answered my prayer, even though he the devil to do it. See friends, the ultimate means of deliverance from our sin is so surprising that many of us reject it altogether. See friends, we all need to be delivered whether we recognize it or not. We are all going to face the judgment of God. We're all going towards that eternal destination of hell. And we need to be rescued from that. Yet we don't acknowledge the rescuer that God has set before us. And instead many of us try to go the way of David and do it ourselves. Rescue ourselves. Make our own decisions. We think... That we can find the answer in our own efforts or, or in the philosophies that this world has to offer. In fact, if you go into bookshops, they're coming down with all the self-help books you can imagine. But if you stand up like I do in my job and say that Jesus is the answer to all of our life's problems and difficulties. That Jesus is the only way that we can be rescued from this judgment. 
then people just laugh at you, mock you, and reject such a ridiculous notion. And it's not just modern times that that happens. Go back to when Jesus was on earth himself. He was rejected. He was despised. He was executed. He was just a carpenter's son from Nazareth. How could he be the Messiah? How can he be the Saviour? Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 that to preach Christ crucified was a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. Friends, that message is still considered foolishness by so, so many. But for those who have accepted it, for those who have placed their trust in Christ, we know that the, the liberation and, and the freedom and the forgiving power of God. We know that this God has rescued us. We know the hope of forgiveness. We know the hope of not going to a lost eternity, but actually going to heaven to be with our Father in that place of perfection where the troubles of this world no longer bother us. Jesus is the Saviour, the only Saviour. He is an unlikely Saviour. It's one that we struggle to get our heads around who he was, why he came to earth, what he did upon the cross. But friends, he is the only hope that we have because he is the one that God sent to rescue a people for himself. The second thing we can learn from David's deliverance is that God's mercy is persistent. Let me start by explaining what mercy is, just in case you've forgotten or don't know what it means in the Bible. Mercy is not getting what we deserve. And as I've already said, according to the scriptures, every one of us deserves the punishment and, and the wrath of God because every one of us has rejected and disobeyed him. Every one of us lives life according to how we see fit. And therefore God, who is a holy and righteous God, has every right to punish us. Every right to reject us and have nothing to do with us. But God is also a merciful God. And so deep and so persistent is his mercy that as the scripture says, while we were still sinners, while we were his enemies, while we were still living a life of deception in, in our Philistia, Depending on our own knowledge and our own wisdom and looking to the philosophies of this world for answers, God sent his only perfect, sinless, obedient son to die upon the cross. And to endure the punishment that we deserved and that he did not. So that we through faith alone in him alone could know God's mercy and have our sin forgiven and wiped away forever. And friends, God's mercy does not stop once we have repented and acknowledged Jesus as Lord and as our only Saviour. Because we are imperfect people. While we are on this earth, we will continue to, to lapse into sin, to, to break God's commands, to, to do our own thing, just as David did. And when David encountered these difficulties in life, when he when he frequently let them overpower him and let them cloud his judgment and made the wrong decision and he ran from the will of God, looking sanctuary in all the other places, God was still merciful. God did not abandon his chosen servant. But God still restored him and forgave him. And friends, we are like David. Let's not put David away up here beyond our reach. We are like David. He was an ordinary man like us. We all make our bad decisions. We all try to deal with our difficulties in our own strength. And we leave God out of that decision-making process. And we do our own thing. But God is merciful. God is great. God will not abandon us. Despite David's foolishness, despite our foolishness, God's mercy does not evaporate. God's mercy is so stubborn that it pursued David wherever he went, even into Philistia. And as one writer says, one can see how Yahweh's mercy still pursues his servants, even in their follies and fainting fits. How strong, tenacious, and on let goable Yahweh's mercy is. 
Yahweh is not short-tempered with his people. His mercy and patience are not exhausted when we choose our foolish Philistias. God's mercy and grace were showed supremely upon the cross when his only begotten son, his perfect son, laid down his life and bore the wrath and the anger and the judgment of God. So you and I, friends, you and I who deserve all of that can be forgiven, can be set free, can be brought into a new life filled with hope and with purpose. And this communion Sunday at this point, we would have been going to the table to take the bread and wine to remember that sacrifice that can bring us new life. Today, we, we can't have those tangible reminders. But today, as we've turned to the word of God, we have been reminded of the salvation, of the hope that can be found in Jesus. Friends, when you turn to him, will you trust in him? If you've drifted from your relationship with the Lord, if, you're, if, if you've turned your back on him because you're under pressure, will you, will you turn back to him? Will you see what a faithful God we have who loves you? who will walk with you, who will carry you, who will help you through these dark times. Please turn and trust in the mercy of God. Let us pray together. Father, we are indeed continuing to live through incredibly uncertain times, filled with confusion, filled with fear, filled with, filled with tragedy. This, this virus is continuing to turn our lives upside down and and while many countries, including our own, are starting to ease restrictions, we are still very limited to what we can safely do. But Father, in the midst of, of what seems troubling and worrying to us as a result of these restrictions, feel in, pale into insignificance as when we consider what others have suffered and encountered this week, the pain that others have been filled with. Father, we want to remember those two families that have been in the news this week whose lives have come crumbling and down around them. For that family in Donegal who lost their, their 11-year-old daughter and for the Smith family in, in Ballycastle who lost uh, a wife, a mother, a daughter, a sister. Father, such times we need family, friends and neighbours to, to, to gather around us and to, and to uphold us and to, to just to be there for us. And that is so difficult in these days of social distancing. But Father, if virus does not stop you, does not keep you away, does not stop you, the God of all compassion, drawing near to those in mourning. So Lord, and loving Father, we pray that these grieving families would know a, a, an overwhelming sense of your love and your comfort and your strength at this time. And Father, we pray for little Hannah Smith, that girl from Bali Castle. We pray that you would help the, the medical team up in, in the Royal Belfast Hospital of her sick children to to, who are watching over her or treating her, Lord, to, to bring healing and uh, to her little body and return her home very soon to her dad. We pray for her dad. We pray for Ryan, Lord, and, and, and the stresses and the struggles he, he's under. None of us can imagine it. And, Father, we just pray for your strength and your hand upon him. And, Father, we just it's, it's a reminder of, of the dangers of the far, in the farming community. And we pray for safety in our farming community, particularly at this busy time for them, and, and especially when the schools are off and more children are at home. Father, we pray that everyone working in that environment would, would be wise and sensible and take extra precautions to protect all who, who live and work on the farms. And Father, as we know that the restrictions are beginning to ease in many countries, and a little bit more freedom is coming around, but Father, we're not out of the woods yet. We pray that people will continue to be sensible. We pray that everyone will continue to do everything necessary to protect themselves and the others, especially the vulnerable in our society. And those who work on the front line essential services, in particular those in our, our health and social care. And Father, we pray for our congregation here in First Bershane. We really do miss not being together. We miss the friendship. We miss the fellowship. We miss not being able to gather around this table and remember in a tangible way all that you have done for us and given to us as a result of your son's sacrifice. Father, we long for the day when we can return here, but not as much as, it, as we should long for the day when he will return and bring all his children to be home with him. Father, in this time of absence, keep us strong. 
Keep us close to you. Keep us remembering that the church is not this building, but it's the people whom you have called to be your own, called to be your servants, servants, called to be salt and light, called to be witnesses in this community. And Father, so help us to proclaim, continue to proclaim your son's death until he comes. And now we reunite in saying the words of the prayer that your son taught us to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Thank you for joining with us today. I really hope that you have been drawn closer into a communion with Jesus as your saviour. And as always, if there's anything you want to talk about, uh, if there's anything you need, uh, need us to pray for, or you want me to pray with you over the phone, please do give us a ring. Give me a shout through Facebook or on our website. And I'll only be too glad to spend time chatting with you and praying with you. But as we come to the end of this time together, this service, we're, we're going to sing that, that song that was sung as, as the service was beginning. Uh, a song that has its foundations in the book of Psalms and the word of God. Psalm 130, from which this song comes from, says, If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, that you may be feared. And because of that wonderful promise, let us wait on the Lord and find our hope in him. Let us praise God. I will wait. Smile.